Are the kids napping? No, we sent them to his mom's house. For this? Uh, yeah. Wow. Knox is very, is it? So is this part of the podcast already? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have yeah, to be. Uh, you know, I, you never know. Like some people start right away and then some people are like, okay, here's what we're going to do and blah, blah, blah. So Knox is very hyper. Um, that's our three-year-old and he would be in and out of here and asking me to pull up stuff on my phone for him. And yeah. Like, like more hyper than a normal three-year-old or no, he's just a three-year-old. I mean, I think we don't know really what to compare <laughs> it to. I mean, given that he's our first toddler, um, but he's got a lot of energy. And of course, like this is around his nap time. So he starts Crazy. throwing, he starts not listening as well. I mean, you know, starts, he starts throwing things and that's when, you know, so we just decided to just, okay, hey, go over to grandma's house and go take a nap there. So Julian's mom is our full-time nanny with both of the boys. Um, and she lives about a mile away from here. Um, That's nice. It's normal. I mean, he's with her usually at this time anyway, but we sent him from our house to her house today. Julian, how old you? By the way, Julian, this is the first time I've been close to you. Well, sort of close to you without you sweating. So That's nice true. to see you in a, in a different environment. <laughs> um, you bring up an, an interesting topic just right off the get-go. So um, when I would have my mom watch, when I would have my mom watch my kids and it was on a schedule, I felt like it was burning my mom out. But when I just let her be the grandma that visits at her own whim, I felt like I got a more real, lively energy out of my mom. So I took her off the schedule. Have you guys noticed like anything like you've dimmed grandma's grandma's light? No, we, so we have her, um, Hey, just be here by eight thirty, nine o'clock. Cause we like to spend time with the boys in the morning and have our own routine. Cause anytime that she comes in, it, it's a, it's a weird dynamic, right? So Knox doesn't, he like, if he, one person doesn't listen to him, then he'll go to the next and then he'll go to the next. So it's like, it's really strange for him. Um, so then at that point, as long as she's here by nine, which allows us to then kind of tackle our responsibilities with SP. Um, but for the most part, you know, she kind of does her thing, gets into a flow with them and then she'll bring them. She'll be done by, she'll leave like around four 30 or five. And then our evening is, uh, you know, it's very important for us to make sure that we have our evening family time together during those times until like nap time, the night routine and everything. So Julian's mom is not a normal grandma. So I don't know how hardcore he went into our social media, but his mom, I think just turned 50. Um, and I mean, she's doing that and then literally go like, she'll go do the SP workout. Either she'll do it here before she leaves or go home. And then she's like over here, like, Hmm, should I like join Instacart and go deliver people groceries? Like she's a very high energy person. Oh yeah. So it's a little bit of a different situation. Um, Julian made a um, post. I think it was a Mother's Day post. You better beat it before I ground you for a month. <laughs> See. Um, <laughs> um, Julian made a, a Mother's Day post. And I'm sitting here on my computer and my wife Haley's in the kitchen. I'm like, wow. And she goes, what? I'm like, Julian's mom is beautiful. So like, I noticed right away that she was younger than your average grandma. Yes. And, yeah, and, and who, who was that guy she was with Julian? Is that someone famous? Oh, I think it was it the post with um, Channing Tatum. Maybe. Yeah. From back when you were acting. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. They'd maybe. make a good couple. They'd make a good couple. <laughs> Yeah, she's young. She had my brother when she was 16 and me when I was like 19. You know, yeah, she had us very young. Um, why did you guys have kids? What was the, um, what was, was it, was it an accident? Was it, um, you guys wanted to see what your love would produce? What was the, what was the. Yeah, I'll let you to answer this one for sure. Unless you want me to start. Uh, yeah, so obviously, Savan, we've known each other for a long time and. Uh, I was married for a long time before and we didn't have kids and it was something that in that relationship was kind of like, I don't know, like I just can't kind of see it type thing. And then, you know, almost exactly 
four years ago right now, I remember Julian and I, we had been dating for like a year and we were on vacation in Belize, just the two of us. And uh, our relationship was interesting. Um, we were talking and we were like, what do you see happening in the next year? Cause we'd been dating. It was like our one year anniversary type thing. And he was like, I don't know. I think, you know, it'd be cool to like start a family brought made no mention of getting married or anything, just having a baby. And, um, but were we, you like with me, were you like, when you yeah. say a family, me with me? Yeah. That's what you meant. Right. Yeah. Okay. Of <laughs> and, um, with him, like it was something that I was much more interested in. Now I will say, um, that Knox, when we found out that I was pregnant with Knox, it was unintentional. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was only about a month after that conversation that it happened. Um, but luckily that conversation had at least come out before the unintentional pregnancy. So, yeah. So, so you were pregnant even before you guys were married. Oh yeah. We, oh, yeah. so funny, um, kind of like timeline, we went on that trip and we were getting ready to move in together potentially. Um, and we were like, had been looking for places to move in together because he was in Northern LA and I was in Orange County, which sounds close unless you live in those places and you know that it, you might as well get on a plane. Um, so we were moving in together in Orange County and we moved in together, found out that I was pregnant and started the street parking Instagram all within like a seven day period. When I, when I was, um, in the, when I was getting ready for this um, podcast and freaking out, like I always do, and I'm like practicing my intros. Um, and the one that kept surfacing to the top, of course, I didn't do it was the fact that in this ecosystem where I've been for the last 15 years, there's a lot of people that have started businesses and you may be, um, by a variety of metrics, the most successful business that came out of this ecosystem that I was in, in the CrossFit ecosystem. It's pretty incredible. Of course, there's Rogue, but it's a very, very specific ecosystem. And yours is, um, and, and, and the metric would be, and I don't mean this insulting to Katie or Bill, but number of barbells sold, right? But yours is a metric that is a little more abstract because you're like, I mean, not, not that Bill and Katie aren't changing lives. I shouldn't have even brought them up. But what the metric, there's a lot of metrics where you could say you're the most successful um, business to come out of, and I don't even know if you refer to yourself as a business, but a business to come out of this ecosystem. And I wanted to say kudos to you. And I was super excited to talk to you guys about it. You guys should be like ecstatic about what you've done. And um, it's the kind of stuff that we, that parents should dream to be able to tell their kids that, Hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I save people's lives. <laughs> I get I, better than that. I empower people to save their own lives. So yeah. congratulations to you. And that could be Thank a whole you. nother conversation that maybe we'll get to. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It's crazy. And it was not, uh, and that was also not necessarily intentional, definitely not to the level that it is now. <laughs> no. I mean, I still remember the one interaction I think I had with you was I was on a tread, I was on an air runner and you came up to me. Oh yeah. 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 And you, cause you had heard from one of the other media people that I was not, if I had qualified, I was not going to go. And I, that's, I remember that's what our first, one of our first conversations actually. Was I, was I um, ever rude to you, Julian? No, you weren't ever rude to me. I, if anything were to describe, if I'm being completely honest, I was always yes, curious. Yes. I was always curious as to why there was never any, um, it always felt like there was the favorites of SoCal. And I never felt like um, my story was ever attempted to be captured. Um, and, and which is actually kind of nice because it kind of made everything more underdogish. You know, even though I had, you know, uh, done something in 2015, there still was the favorites. And then there was the reset. And again, all this comes with, um, you know, what do you do in the sport of CrossFit? But then 2017, it was good. It, I think it was really good that way because it actually kept me focused and to my purpose as to what my goal for that weekend was until day three. So you were never rude. I was just always curious as to why the media side of things never even attempted to expand more than just the certain group of athletes to create, to have some kind of, it's just more story, I guess, but it just made everything more worth it at the end of it. Um, so the answer to your question is um, twofold. I want to say two things. One, I've heard what you've said 
from a hundred athletes throughout the years. Why wasn't my story told? Oh yeah, of course. You're the you're the only one that was intentional. You were courting my homeboy's lady. <laughs> I was and I was avoiding you like the plague. Can I just tell you that's what I was gonna say. The 27 days. You're the only you're the only one of a hundred athletes that's accused me of doing that. Now let me tell you, I pick my favorites by how easy people are to interview, and you were you are exceedingly easy to interview. So it was my professional mistake. It's a I'm a, I'm a scumbag of the highest order. But but I choose my athletes not by how well they perform, but um, but mostly just by how easy they're to approach. I mean, Josh Bridges is like I, mean, I use him as the poster child, right? Sure, Jason sure. Kalipa, Neil Maddox. I mean, yeah. um, and, and generally, and to be completely honest, the men in general were easier to approach. Sam Briggs. I mean, man, if you're a lazy interviewer, she's there. You were amazing, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, yeah, there's there's a dynamic and a history there between one of my coworkers and Miranda, and I'm like, yeah, I'm just I'm just I'm just that's why I asked you if I was rude. I'm just like, I'm just not. doing. No, it. no I never got any of that at all. Good. And good. OK, that, good. I was <laughs> very I mean, it wasn't like that. And I told Miranda, like, I had nothing against like Tyson or anybody. Like, I mean, honestly, I knew I, I didn't jump in sabotaging their relationship. It was like their relationship was at a different stage. So I never had any guilt going into us. But I, I understood. I was like I, and I even told her, I was like, look, I don't care. Like, if you need to go talk to Tyson to kind of clear the. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was at that stage of like, go for it. Like I trust you. I don't, I'm feeling pretty, com I feel confident in myself as an individual. So I don't, yeah. Yeah. The 2017 warm up area was so, I mean, you had like, he was there and Tyson was in there filming and Mariah's in there filming and I'm in there pregnant. And it's just like, what a disaster. Like, I love it. The best yeah. actually. <laughs> Um, tell me, so, so you, you get pregnant and you're, it's not intentional. Are you scared? Are you like, oh my God, how are we going to make ends meet? Who's going to take care of the baby? What am I going to do about my next gig? Like, does your brain just start reeling? So this was actually, my pregnancy actually came about, I want to say two months after I had left the seminar staff also, which was a huge income for me. I worked for Progenics, um, on top of that, but CrossFit HQ was two thirds of my income because I was a flow master and I had like a retainer for like the media stuff and all of it. Um, but no, he had a, he had his meal prep business, um, which was doing well in California. And I was working for Progenics. And I think both of us are just kind of scrappy when it comes to like, you figure it out and then we've always got some random side idea or this thing going or that thing going. I've, I always had multiple sources of income. So, and he was the same way. Um, so I don't think we ever really even brought that up. No, we weren't really worried about that just because, yeah, we always made things work. We worked really well together from the get-go. Um, I, once she wasn't really working for, um, seminars, I don't think she, I don't think at this time she was working for seminars or maybe she was, but when I was doing my meal prep business at the time, I knew the weight that she carried and then my ability to kind of have conversations with the people in general. We were both, I guess, athletes or well-known in the CrossFit community. So we use that as an advantage not to be like shitty people or tool bags, but just, hey, like we actually have knowledge based off of what we do. So we would do like nutrition seminars at some of the gyms that I would provide meals for. And we, I would set those kinds of things up. I would do catering. She had the progenics thing. So we really made sure we intertwined what we did and it was working out really well, actually. So are, are you good with your, your money, Miranda? Like, like when you were doing seminars and like, did you manage your, your money? Well, are you good? Like fiscally um, responsible person? So I would say I'm responsible. I, it's not like I was like making investments or doing anything cool like that. Um, but I'm not a big spender. Um, you live within your means. Yeah, when I moved to SoCal and I was living on my own for honestly on my own on my own for the first time ever in my life, I got an apartment that was more expensive than was necessary and I had a nice car, but it wasn't like over the top. It was, um, yeah, so I, I was never, I didn't have any credit cards. Like I think I got my first credit card like maybe five years ago in my life. So I was pretty good that way, but I wasn't like, I could have been doing more um, for sure, but yeah. 
How, how old are you? 38. And how old are you, Julian? 31. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you guys look young. Julian, <laughs> look, wow. <laughs> Cradle robber, Miranda. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. I've said that before, and someone told me you can't do that. Oh, it's okay. It's fine. Um, it's interesting. I didn't know you had the meal prep business. I apologize for not knowing that. And what I'm thinking now is, wow, what a great um, mixture street parking is. You have two people who have this, I mean, ob obsession with with health and fitness. But then you have Julian coming from this business background, like like buy and sell, you know, the meal prep business, and then you coming from the 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 ultimate training program in the world, and then yeah. basically bringing those together. Am I seeing that right? Is that what happened? The peanut butter and the chocolate mix? Yeah, and I think sometimes what people because it's it's very clear now that people have tried to copy and mimic street parking to a t like and and that's flattering right clearly like we've set the standard and we're holding it um and we're very prideful of that you know what people all people will always wonder they're like why it doesn't take off and honestly part of it is luck and fate because it's not just let's create street parking it's the two individuals and our two individual stories of years and years of years that led up to, so we were already building a story, which then led to street parking being formed, right? Miranda had a really amazing experience as a coach, as a seminar flow master, all everything there. I was very like, I was very into fitness, very raw about it. I was coaching under the wings of some very experienced athletes at the time, but I was dedicated to it. But also at the same time, I was an entrepreneur in the sense that I would to make ends meet, I knew that coaching just didn't cut it. I was only coaching so I could get a free membership, which was my way of saving money there. But I was like selling salsas at uh, and cupcakes at these hair salons, barber shops. I would literally make these salsas and cupcakes and go sell them um, at elementary schools in the hood back in, in North Hills during their lunch times when or after when kids would get out of school. I knew their parents were the ones that had the money. So I would post up on the sidewalk with all these other Mexican vendors and I would just quickly make 50, 100, $150 cash. And then I would move on, right? So it, it made you, it forced you to be good with people, to go in and know how to sell, to know that you can have an amazing product, but if you don't have the personality to back that up and be a good people person, you know, you don't have nothing. And so you combine both of us to that, she picks up on a lot of the weaknesses that I had, which is, to be honest, more polished and more professional in a sense, where I was very on the hood side of things mm -hmm. and less structured, but I still had that entrepreneur drive, the hustle. So you combine both of us together, we came up with this street parking idea, and then it just kind of flowed and it, became, it was super easy and natural for us to do it. Oh, I love to hear that. I can just, I was picturing just now just being charming to mothers as they drop off their kids and they're, they're rushing off to work. And then they say, Julian's selling cupcakes. And they're like, I'll make a stop. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I, get a I, I, I'll get a cupcake from Julian. Deny that, I would be silly because it, I knew, and I would use that to my advantage. I mean, I would wear these like shirts, these deep V-necks. I mean, to, if I would look back at some of those pics, I'm like, what were you wearing? But <laughs> I would use my physical shape because it's not every day that you have like a cupcake person walking in or selling salsas. And then, you know, I, I just knew how to the tone of a room or the tone of my environment to make sure that I, I made ends meet. And it was great. And, and on, on top of those, all those things you mentioned that you guys had that equipped you and prepared you for this business, you guys both had tons of camera time. Mm -hmm. So you were already comfortable with lights or cameras or people walking around while you're working out or talking to the camera and not being self-conscious. So it, was, it, it really was a perfect storm. And then, I mean, to add to that storm, going back to the pregnancy, to be honest, so we launched uh, the street parking Instagram. And I think like, like I said, like five days later, maybe a week later, I found out I was pregnant. And my very first response was, well, there goes the street parking idea because I had been for however many years, 10 years, Miranda with abs. Like I was one of the first like well-known CrossFit figures with six pack, you know? And I was like, nobody wants the Miranda pregnant program. Like that's, this isn't going to work. And it had the exact opposite 
effect. Like it was all the moms who had been watching me and who were also pregnant or had just been pregnant. Like they bought in so much harder than if it would have been the Miranda, the athlete and the timing was unintentional, but it was perfect for where we're at now. Holy and get me pregnant. That's what we need to kickstart the business. <laughs> what about the kid? Oh, we'll figure that out. <laughs> Was it difficult um, to, to, you were known as Miranda Oldroyd. Was it difficult to, to sh any difficulty in shifting for your own psyche or for your brand or for the business or? Yeah, there was a, there was a conversation that um, Tyson and I had because my Instagram was still Miranda Oldroyd for a long time, like deep into I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, we were going through some things in our relationship because again, our relationship was super new when I was pregnant that we weren't like, yay, we're pregnant. Next step, let's get married. Like we weren't there yet. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, and so I was still Miranda Oldroyd and, and I got a call from Tyson and um, as demanding as Tyson can be, which is not very demanding. Let's be honest. He's like, so nice. He was saying, you need to change your Instagram handle. And he's like, I don't care what you change it to. You need to change it. And I had been CrossFit Miranda and when the 2015 games happened and we got like booted out and we were all like drunk afterwards or whatever, I changed it to uh, Miranda Oldroyd. And that was like a big deal getting a text from Dave, like you took the CrossFit out of your name. Like, <laughs> and, then, and then I was Miranda Oldroyd and I'm like, well, am I going to change it to Miranda Chivers, which is my, my maiden name. And it was just, I had a really hard time with it because I wasn't Miranda Chivers. Like uh, I was a different person than before I was married and before I had found CrossFit. Um, so going back to that felt like a step backward, but I didn't know what to change it to. So yeah, there was like some time where I was like, I don't know, I don't know who I am. I'm not Miranda Alcaraz, but I'm also not Miranda Chivers. I understand I'm not Miranda Oldroyd, which is why I was like, no last names, fearless Miranda. That way I never have to change it again. And, but it was a, that was a tough situation. It was. it was awkward. Yeah. Was it really tough or just tough between your ears? Like, was it like, was there really anything out there? Was it, was that like, is that 95% just your trip? No, I think, um, no. I like don't think were parents, like were parents pressuring you or was Julian pressuring you or was there like shit like that? Or was it just be? No, you know, I think as a, as like a female, not to get into like female empowerment or anything like that. I was like tired. Of, I didn't like the fact that I kept having to change my name and it, it was only impacting me. So like going from be, having a maiden name to the married name to back to the maiden name to potentially another new married name. Like it was more of like, you got, I, I'm not, I'm tired of being passed around and like being told what my name is by the dudes that are in my life, basically. Uh, but do you want his last name now? I have his last name now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And do, and do you like that? Yeah. When Tyson <laughs> had the call, we weren't ready to like, be like, okay, well let's just go get married. We weren't there yet. So yeah. I felt like in this like weird phase, plus I was probably like six months pregnant and just hormonal. So my, my son recently asked me, um, so are you and mom married? And I said, oh yeah. I go, and then my wife said, you were at the wedding. And we pulled up because he was like, we didn't get married till he was like two and a half. And he's like, oh shit, I was there. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, I, I, I still forget that my wife has my name. So I call her Miss Parlin instead of Miss Matosian all the time. Like just joking around. Then I'll be like, wait, wait, she has my, she has my name. Yeah. So you get, so you, so you get street parking off the ground, you have the first kid and, um, is it just is it just constant growth basically? I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about the minutia, but is it? And, and how many years ago was that? This will be it's coming up on four years. Yeah, is it just four years of wow? We're, we're we're this is just flowing. I mean, I was looking at it, the video. Every the quality has just incrementally gotten better. By the way, just from a quick glance, it's amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's cool you started where you did though. Uh, I mean, our goal, honestly, when we started was to have a hundred members because we just wanted, we'd be like, that'd be so cool to have like this little community and people can like, you know, talk about their home workouts and we can pay our super expensive California bills, you know? Um, and within the first month, I think we had 700 members 
And then, yeah, since then it's been growth every month for four years. Have you ever, when you got those 700 members, were you like, oh shit, what have we done? Yeah, it me, oh, 100%. <laughs> like, like you experience. felt this huge responsibility. Yes. Yeah, and it took us a while to adapt to that actually because we didn't know it was going to take off that way. But then um, when she had let, you stopped being a flow master and then she was working for Progenix and then she was on um, uh, maternity leave, I told her, I was like, if we have 1500 members, I think it might be a good idea for you not to go back because, you know, maybe this is the opportunity that people talk about when you go full in on something and you don't have a plan B, like you, you go full in, like this is, this is it. And you will give your hundred percent effort to it. And then, so that happened. And then at, at, we said at 2000 members, I'll get, stop the meal prep business. And then it did happen pretty quickly. And then we both fully jumped into it. And then it just, we made sure um, to just keep the quality and the consistency of it from when we made that commitment. So you were a flow master. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Are you proud of that? Absolutely. You, you come... You, I want to go back for, for both of you. What, what, what did you guys, and then I want to build up to this whole flow master thing, because to me, the red shirts are some of the most remarkable human beings on the planet. I mean, I just, it, it's crazy to work on the L1 staff. Um, wh where did your first fitness, both of you, um, light bulbs go off? Like, when did you guys start getting into like, okay. And by fitness, I mean, sports, any athleticism, any like, okay, this is, this is who I am. This is part, part and parcel of who I am. So I didn't really play sports much growing up. My, my older brothers played hockey. And when I was super young, like seven, eight years old, I played hockey. Um, and then it was more like dance and things like that. Not that that's not a sport, but it's not the typical thing that people think of when they think of sports. When I was a senior in high school, no, when I was a junior in high school, one of the girls, uh, on my cheerleading squad had a six pack. And I was like, I want, that's super cool. And she was like, join the track team and there you go. And so I was like, absolutely. So the next year I joined the track team and that was the first time that I had ever like had somebody attempt to teach me how to like back squat or bench press or anything. Cause we would do some, you know, lifting in the gym. And that was my, my real first experience in um, a sport in a way. Um, but I fell in love with fitness uh, from from there on, and and have pretty much worked in it since then. Uh, for me, it was I was all I was complete. I was very into sports in high school, junior high. I mean, my dad had me in soccer, and I did baseball. I'm everything. Like my dad would always play sports with me, you know, uh, at most random things: ping pong, racquetball, everything. Um, and then when I graduated high school, as I was doing the uh, my dedication or I thought what my dedication was going to be was acting at the time. But then I got a job at this like, like boot camp thing because boot camp were, was a huge thing back when I, in 2008, it was like the boot camp outdoor training. I got a job as a trainer there. And then um, I just knew I just like coaching people and pushing them. And uh, I think I got that definitely from the, my wrestling background and my coaches that I had in that, you know, and I just wanted to pass that feeling of just, you know, making people push outside of their comfort zone. Um, and then I found CrossFit. It, my brother took me, if it wasn't for my brother, I don't think I would have dove into CrossFit the way I did because he took me to the 2011 games. He was super fanboy and Miranda and like the Andrew Agers and the, all, all, you know, China Cho and all of them at the time. Hogan, boy. So we went to the 2011 games. And I think that's when I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Like, I feel like this is a, uh, a nice challenge to go get good workouts in. And then after that, it just completely took off, which shifted my mindset from acting. CrossFit really sidetracked me and kept, uh, took me away from that. It pulled me out, which I'm glad it did because it just showed how not committed I was to acting really. You said your dad put you into everything. Tell me, was that, is that a good thing? That's well, my own personal I, curiosity. He, the, the good thing about him is he never forced me anything. He always participated with me. So when it came to soccer, when we were kids, he would just like come in the backyard and we'd just play soccer. It was me, him, and my brother. 
it was like both of me and him against him. And then, um, you know, baseball, same thing. We would, when he'd get off of work, he would set up like little T baseball in, in our front yard and we just play, we just play sports. So it was the memories of happiness that I remember, which made me enjoy sports. It was never, I'm signing you up for this. It was always like, then I would go watch him play soccer in a league. And then I'd be like, dad, I want to play soccer. And then he would sign me up. And then, um, you know, with, and then baseball, things like that. And then when my brother got into wrestling, then of course I wanted to, I love my brother. I wanted to be like my brother and my brother's like, you would do good at this. And, or if it was basketball, my dad would take us to the park. And it was memories that led me to loving sports. If, if you had to choose one or when you choose one, how, how will you do Knox? What will you, how will you put him into that arena? Which sports will you do baseball, basketball? Will you I, would do wrestling? Say, I would say soccer for sure. Just coordination. Athleticism is great. Um, you know, but the, the beautiful thing about parenting now is just being aware of what he actually is enjoying, mm -hmm. you know? So if he's what we're at the park, we were at the park the other so day funny. and he was, he got mesmerized by this kid playing football with his dad. And so it's like, okay, like, let's go get a football. And sure enough, he latches on to that. So it's never forcing what I love onto him. It's if he enjoys something, then we introduce that to him and see if it latches or if it doesn't. Um, because you, you know, us being, I think one of the benefits of both me and her being in the top level of competitive mindset is you understand the unhealthy things that can happen on that road, right? You see it from certain athletes that don't do it for the love of it. They actually are dreading it, but now it's like a job or uh, I feel pressured because of this individual. It's never because, wow, I truly love being here. So in knowing that, it's what we kind of try to do with Knox. So just paying attention, observing, and, you know, really seeing what evolves through that. Does he, does he know what the two of you guys do? Does he know the family business? <laughs> no, not yet. I mean, not yet. I can't even imagine what is in his brain about what we do because we film everything still at our house. And so we constantly like have all of our staff over and we're filming and we're working out here and we're running up and down the street and, I mean, we've took him. I mean, Knox went to Hawaii. Yeah, he's, gone he's to been to summer camp. So many like, places with us. Yeah, Vegas. Yeah, yeah. where we have these massive two hundred plus meetups of members that show up. So you know, he he'll figure it out. Yeah, he'll figure it out. He thinks you're running the Hell's Angels. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Kind of. Well, uh, and there's two babies, right? Yeah. So the little one, Banner, he is. He'll be six months next week. I can't believe you had a baby six months ago. Yeah, she's crushing it. Why? Because you're crushing. Just it. yeah, you're just crushing it. Yeah, exactly. Do people tell you that all the time? Uh, I mean, I don't really see people other than our staff, mm -hmm. especially this year. You know, so yeah. You mentioned that you, um, when you were living in California, the steep California prices, and now you live in Washington State. Mm -hmm. Is that an economic move? Is that like, hey, we're not doing this California <laughs> game anymore? Yeah, when we were looking, we realized that um, real estate properties were just so expensive where we wanted to live, which is Irvine at the time. It just wasn't worth it. She was from Utah. I was from Oregon. We knew that you get way more land. And we just didn't really want to get caught up in the scene over there. It just wasn't our vibe. We wanted a place that was more like neighborhood vibes, more peaceful, outdoors, more nature, and not put a value on how much money you have. Um, so when you had to kind of address that early on, then as street parking was growing, we were looking at places, um, like Washington, cause it has no sales tax and then, uh, no, tax. sorry, no state income tax. So then we, we found the border, which is Vancouver, which is literally right across the bridge. And Vancouver has been up and coming and being developed a lot in the last 10 years. You have HP out here. You have a lot of tech companies coming out here now. So it's been, a, it's been a really, and we actually feel like we came here at the right time because now you can see it in real estate values. People are leaving Portland to come to Vancouver. People are leaving California to come to Vancouver for that state income uh, tax benefit alone. And when you perspective, right, you come from Cali, you know, this home that we're in right now, 3,800 square feet on a quarter acre lot would cost you a two mil in a place that you want to live over there, a neighborhood. 
And so here we got it for not even nowhere near close to that. Um, so we it, would be four, right it would be 4 million in Santa Cruz. Oh, oh yeah, man. Yeah. So we, we made the right jump at the right time for sure. And uh, it's paid off and it's kept us. One of the things too, that we feel it drowned, it took away all the noise, like, you know, the competitive gym culture, SoCal culture, always like, you know, grinding, no sleep, this and this and that. Like we know that comes with the territory of starting a new business, but to feel like you need to keep up with that environment was not what we wanted. Right. So coming here really has made it, like she said, I haven't really, we don't really talk to anyone. Do we engage with our staff? I feel like that's been really good for us because we don't always have people sending us praise or this and this and that. It keeps us focused on our family, our team, our community. And, and that's, it's great. It's great for us. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Sorry. It's okay. One second. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Was there a temptation to move to Cookville? Never, ever. <laughs> okay. Because there's no, there's no state income tax there. Yeah, but it's like, it, that, that's, but the environment that we were trying to not be around is heavy there. Like, uh, and I, we have nothing, I, I don't have a close relationship with anybody that lives in Cookville, but I also don't have any like weird feelings around it, but it's like, we wanted some separation for what we're doing versus where we were coming from type thing. Yeah. And then we have like, my dad's here too. We also wanted to be close still to Utah, which is where Miranda's family's at. My dad's in Tillamook, Oregon still, which he's like a 90 minute drive away. So that played a huge role. My mom obviously relocated and moved back with us here. And, you know, she knows all her friends as well. So all that got made it very appealing to just come here. And it was, it was a good move. Uh, you sort of answered this when you said, you know, when you're all in, you're all in, but you guys are embarking on a new business uh, and at this time. It was a new business. It was a new family. It was a relatively new relationship. And then to move to a new state, I mean, it's really for like, you almost have to have your blinders on to do that much change. Mm -hmm. Um because those are the kind of things at night, like if you fall asleep and your brain's weak, you'll scare the shit out of yourself, right? You'd be like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. This is a lot of change. I mean, there's, you, you, you kind of uprooted any stability you had, psychological, physical. You guys were just like, okay, we're, we're in it. You know, there was like a couple moments, um, you know, when we first found out that I was pregnant, that I think even before the going all in on the business thing happened, where we had like some really hardcore, are we all in on each other that happened before the business even. And um, so I think that was in place heavily before uh, the business all in thing happened or the moving thing happened or anything like that was the relationship. Yeah, and I, that would definitely, I would take responsibility for that mostly because Miranda is one thing that she definitely has had is just stable, long relationships, which that is a good thing, right? I was very um, unstable in relationships that I had in Los Angeles from my, you know, from being out there since I was 17. From 18 till 26, when I met her, I mean, to be honest, my dating life was a disaster. Um, I, I don't regret any of it be, because it clearly showed me a lot of experience. The only thing that I had, I had to also commit myself to addressing a lot of those things. I mean, we did uh, a lot of uh, counseling. Um, and then I knew that I had a lot of internal issues. We all do. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of like, do you want to deal with them? And I, and I knew that once that started to come up, I was like, I ha there's so much more that I need to clearly let out. Because for the longest time, when you're alone, which I was there, I had no family. I mean, I had my brother, but even my brother had a lot of his, his issues, right? A lot of, so I had to untangle all of that. I had to untangle all my insecurities as an individual, uh, you know, what, what I didn't think I was capable of or worthy of because all that was being pushed on to her. And I knew that was unhealthy, right? And um, once that, you also have to make that commitment and um, because then everything else kind of felt easy Mm -hmm. um, after that, you know, then you accept the fact that 
you know, the relationships come with their ups and downs because for the longest time, it's like, oh, this relationship's not going well. And then you're like, you know, you chase the next carrot of the next whatever that you meet out and all that social scene. And then um, there's no standards. There really isn't really standards much in LA. I told her, I always knew that if I really wanted to commit to a relationship, I just had to get out of here. Um, this LA is not long-term sustainability, you know, or places like this, right? Um, because there's so many distractions, not just physically, but with other opposite sex, right? But also, you know, in work environment and things like that, which take you away from your family time, which if that's not sealed, then it really um, creates a crack, gets bigger and bigger. And then there's resentment. Um, you know, even us here with not no distractions, we, I mean, you know, shit's hard, right? I mean, we, we constantly go through a lot of obstacles and luckily the communication has gotten really a lot better, a lot. And, but it also took, you know, I committed to reading a lot of these self-development books, a lot of them, and also working my on my self-confidence because I'm not going to lie, it was intimidating for me for Miranda being so successful on her own. I wasn't used to that, you know? Um, and so she she constantly pushed me without her knowing it. And I would tell her to, I got either I play the victim and then I try to play the person who's like, you know, ego gets in the way because she's, you know, um, a lot smarter than me. I'm certain like a lot of stuff, or I take the time to use this as drive and motivation to the now self educate myself, work on my weaknesses. So that way I can be a better husband and we can be more, feel like we're more equals, but that's not her fault. It was my fault. It was, it was my responsibility to feel like I can be an equal to my spouse, you know? I'm never going to remember all three questions I want to ask you. When you went, when you went to counseling, was it like, okay, shit, I got some issues. I'm going to go to counseling. Or did you, do you already see the fireworks first? Are you like, like you see yourself, oh shit, I'm sabotaging this. I'm fucking this up. This, I, I really don't want to fuck this up. I should go get a fire hose and put this fire out. Yeah. Or was it like, Hey, I know that there's going to be a problem on the horizon. Was it a preemptive strike or did you see the smoke first? I definitely was the one like fucking things up with my communication and the, my actions that I was doing at the time. And I, I was, I suggested it. I was like, Hey, like, I would like to go to counseling, you know, like, give, you know, would you, are you willing to go with this with me? And she was like, yes. And so <laughs> Did, does that trip you out? Did that trip you out at all, Miranda? Or were you like flattered by that? Or were you like, oh my God, this is awesome. He really wants to make this work. Or are you like, what the fuck have I got myself into? I don't want to spend time doing this. No, no. So one thing kind of going back to the, the day that Julian and I met was a couple months after the 2015 games where we had both competed. So it was the year that I was on NorCal's team and he had competed for the first time. And all that I knew of him was that he was the dude that took Josh Bridges spot and made it so Josh couldn't go to the games. And he was like some random, I knew his name. I knew that he was from California and that he went to the games. Like that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And he was a coach at Becca's gym and I was in town for a seminar. And so I was at the gym and uh, we didn't really talk during the workout, um, but there was some traffic situation where some guy tried to jump off one of the bridges in LA. So it like shut down the whole thing. And so we were kind of stuck at the gym after we were done working out and I was hungry. My hotel was like 20 minutes away. And he, I asked him if there was like a place that I could go eat. And we, we ended up just having a meal together. And I wasn't in the mind frame of like, oh, like, let me check this guy out. And I don't know that he was either at that time. He had a girlfriend. Um, but at that point, I mean, I had been around all of the games athletes for years. So like, a, a handsome fit dude doesn't really like you have to be stand out in a different way for me to like even think twice right and you know I think a lot of people probably assume that our story is just like oh yeah they liked to work out together and they were both had abs so you know baby let's make a baby but that's not at all what it was he was so different and this person that's talking right now and the way that he's speaking and the confidence that he has and what a good dad he is I saw that in him in that meal and he was not talking about thrusters and burpees and stuff we were talking about his salsa lessons that he was taking and how he liked to cook and like it was such a different conversation than i was used to with male 
CrossFit Games athletes, I guess. Um, and I'm so glad that I saw that because everybody else in his life at that time saw the Julian that was like always hooking up with chicks and trying to be the actor and wearing the deep V-necks. And I was able to see through that and see this person. And um, I think it's a really important part of our story. And so I just was always confused when people would treat him like the, the Julian that maybe he was acting like, cause that's not who I saw. Um, but anyway, coming back to the, the counseling thing. Um, no, I, I, I wanted to do it. Um, it's actually something that I had suggested, uh, in a earlier in a, my previous relationship and, um, we never went and did it. Um, and so it's something that I had always been open to and thought could be helpful and useful. And, you know, I was pregnant when he, when we were having this conversation. And of course, when there's a kid that's coming, you want to have as strong as a really of a relationship as possible. Um, but I feel like it usually is the, of the female in the relationship that would suggest something like that. So I was surprised, but I was happy about it. And is it instantaneous? You start seeing results and things start getting better. Like the first time you drive away from a counseling no, session, you're like, oh shit. That's it. It. Or like, are you in the car? Are you in the car? Just like looking at the person? Like, like I can't fucking believe you said Yeah, it was so funny because I would, I, I would feel bad for our counselor because like the time would be up. And I mean, they're professional about it. Like, like hey, like, and sometimes we would leave as to kind of like with things that really heated and escalated. And she was just like, okay, guys, like, um. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember a lot of the times you leaving that session, taking a moment to pause and looking at each other and hugging each other. You can't, if you take that home, then you're setting yourself up for failure. So I'd always try to crack some, no matter how I was feeling that reinforcement of a hug or cracking some kind of joke. And I, tr you know, I remember trying that to kind of lighten up the thing so that way it became easier to kind of talk about it, but it was, it was really hard. I mean, it was so hard for like the whole year. Well, I actually think it was harder when we had our counselor because, you know, you always felt like you had a partner, like if, you know, to lean on, if like, oh, well, I was trying to do this. Right. But it, and it kind of took away. So there's that mediator, which is good. I always knew though, that you were, it, it was successful when we could do it on our own, you know, and learning how to identify things that trigger us, you know, and, and just how to have, you know, constant communication, you know, even now as uncomfortable as it may be. So, you know, it's still difficult, but you're, you become okay with it being difficult because you know that the outcome of that is, is great. It was, it I mean, he's taken a lot of the like burden onto himself. I, I would say that I came into our relationship um, where I wasn't good about speaking up in relationships in the past. And not that I, I ever really had like a ton to speak up about in my past relationship, but just a lot of feeling emotional, deep conversations just never really happened in that relationship. And so I, it, I was very um, adamant about not repeating that. And I think when you come from what I, where I was coming from is I was trying not to repeat all the things that caused issues before. And so I, I was learning how to, I don't like to upset people. And I was learning how to like be okay with upsetting him or telling him when I was mad or telling him. And that was new for me and I wasn't very good at it. Uh, so, I mean, I had a lot to, to grow with it too. Mm -hmm. That's a really strong point right there. You said not, being okay that if you upset people that is that's huge yeah of so so, so and now you have 40 employees <laughs> so you have this relationship that was on it's not the fastest relationship in the world not even close but it's fast especially from where i'm coming from i was with my wife for five years before i started dating her and then another 15 years before we had kids right so, and, and yours is a, is a five-year relationship and you right now, right? And you have two kids. So, so it's not like you met and got pregnant the first night, but it's fast. You guys are like, there's no time to, you're not dilly-dallying. Um, and now you have 40 other people 
um, kind of in your relationship that you guys to separate you guys from your business is impossible. You guys are super glued to it, right? You guys are the living embodiment of your business, right? How has, how is managing that? How is managing 40 people and do all of them have access to you? And do they, what do, does their relationships with you complicate your relationships? I mean, I know that's a lot of questions, but I mean, I just see this and going back to LA, by the way, LA is just one giant mating game. I mean, you nailed it. You got to get out of there. It's not LA's fault, but if you want to be in the mating game, go to LA. If you don't get, get out. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, it's what it is. And there's no, there's no problem with that. We're made here to put on the planet to mate, but we're here to do some other stuff too. So once you're done, once you find your perfect mate, like you two did, you're good. Um, okay. So these 40 people, how do they play into this? How do you manage that? What's it look like? I mean, obviously it's like, that's one of those things. Do you have where, your 20 and she has her 20? No, it's, it is one of those things where that's where obviously I think counseling did a lot more benefit because, and the constant working on yourself as an individual plays a huge role in um, when it, managing people as well. Right. Because it's all relationships, how you build your relationship with your team you know, and, and um, it's been evolving. Um, they do have access to us anytime they want. And we've also- all, for, all 40 of them? I would say some people, no, there's some people that like Molly man manages and stuff like that. But I would say about 30 of them have access to us. Um, but that's okay though, right? I mean, we don't, we don't want to- No, that's not okay. <laughs> I mean, so they now know we're at a point where they will reach out to us if they really need us. So they have access to us in that sense. And they, I think it's, they kind of know when to do so, but we've empowered them to make decisions on their own, to it's okay to make mistakes, do it, you know, and if something like really shit really hits the fan, let us know. But for the most part, they come in, they, we, well, a lot of the stuff, people that we have here, they work out with us, we work out with them. It's like our way of kind of really bonding with them, making sure that they, you know, feel connected to us and we feel connected to them. Um, but right now we have a pretty good schedule of not feeling the need to always be at the office, um, trusting them with the work responsibilities that they have. At the same time, you know, they can call us and a lot of them are really cool people. So we actually enjoy talking mm -hmm. to them too. Like they're, they're great people to talk to. And, you know, we've created a really good culture and we're really proud of it because um, they're not really annoying. We don't have annoying people. No. I would say he's much stronger at um, management of people. Um, I'm much more organized in other ways, but when it comes to like having hard conversations or things like that, he's he's way better at that than I am. Do, do two questions? Do do you ever get calls like at like six p.m. from someone being like, "Hey, you guys haven't done the workout yet. We're supposed to post it in an hour. What the fuck are you guys doing?" Um, I mean, does it ever get like, do you have, is there, is there someone cracking the whip on you guys over there uh, or Miranda, yeah. you're not even in frame on this one. Like, what are you doing? Or so, so it's not so much it, we're the organization as a whole is much more organized than it used to be. So stuff happening last minute like that is, is not likely. Um, and I would give credit to all of them and not us for that. So both of us are like fly by the seat of your pants. We'll do it 10 minutes before, like no problem. Both of us can vibe like that but most of them prefer to have some way more like you know organized they want their saturday and sunday off so they want you to do the workouts five days in advance yeah they've <laughs> created that those systems not us okay S second question you in, in my opinion you come from a lineage of one of the most amazing leaders I've ever met in my life, Dave Castro and the chain of command that he had and the structure he had in place and, and Nicole had in place um, the two of them together. You had a, this amazing speaker in Nicole and you had this amazing guy who, who organized it in Dave, not that Dave can't talk and Dave can't uh, Nicole can't organize, but um, did you learn a ton there? Because from watching how they managed that L1 team, and the importance of chain of command and not leaving the chain of command and everyone fulfilling their duties and setting high expectations and trusting your staff. Like those are like, I couldn't believe it. I learned so much from them. Is that where you cut your teeth? Do you share that with Julian? Does Julian already know that? How does that work? 
So I would say I just full of shit and you didn't learn anything from Dave. No, I gained so much from (laughs) that experience and from both of them in different uh, ways. I would say the number one way that working for CrossFit impacted me was it taught me the importance of feedback um, combined with how that feedback and taking it and doing something with it, the confidence level that it gives a person where I think a lot of times we don't want to give people feedback because we don't want to hurt their feelings. But when you can give somebody feedback and you can see them take it on and become better because of it, the confidence level, I was thinking about this literally yesterday about um, how Dave and Nicole believed in me so much um, and, and allowed me to become a flow master and, and believe and trusted me with that. Like that was so, so huge. Like what a big confidence boost, you know, I had to earn it for sure. Um, but they always were pushing you to do more and try more and be better and do this lecture. And the, but then giving you feedback and basically telling you how much it sucked right afterwards. And then, but here, go try it again. You know, it wasn't ever like that sucked never again. It was that sucked. Here's how to make it better. Go try again. And that, I mean, whether it's parenting or managing people or, you know, trying to get people to improve, um, I learned so much from that. And then, I mean, I bring it up still in our meetings about the um, professionalism and about, no, if we tell our members we're going to be at the meetup at 9 a.m., I don't care if it's, you know, some like loose thing at the park and it's people bringing their dumbbells and it's not a big deal. We need to be there before they get there. Like I'm still Mm -hmm. very hardcore on that type of stuff. And I am not that way in the rest of my life. I'm always late to everything unless it's work related where it's with our members that I get pretty hardcore about that sort of thing. And I mean, even down to like, we had a summer camp with our members last year. We had to cancel it this year because of COVID, but um, where we were like running events um our events were more like you know uh slip and slide with jello at the end and they're like running around and fun stuff um but i mean i had or i had seen behind the scenes of the crossfit games for years and so like mapping that stuff out and planning it and structuring it and making sure everything has been tested the night before and that no, no stone left unturned for what could possibly go wrong what if it rains what are we going to do for the i learned all of that from my time at crossfit um, you mentioned something now that I also experienced working with um, Dave and Nicole, um, especially with Dave, is that he would set expectations higher than he believed in me more than I believed in him. And so I would live up to it. But what's interesting is I heard Julian say the same thing about you, I think early in the interview that you set expectations for him, you didn't know you were setting them so high, but he sort of felt a, a responsibility to live up to him. And he liked that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, I feel like that's a huge part of raising kids too. Mm -hmm. Like set expectations really high for them, respect them, believe in them. I mean, if they fail, they fail. So what? But like, right. I mean, did I hear that right? Julian, I didn't mean to put words in your head, but you were saying you were intimidated at first and she set the bar really high for you. Yeah. By her just being her, which was her natural work ethic. It pushed me to either. I continue sitting around and doubting myself and being like, Oh, well, like, why don't you pay attention to me or why don't you show me? Or I take it upon myself to now learn and get what do I need to learn so that way I can bring this to the table, you know? And um, yeah. It reminds me of a story at the 2016 regionals we were dating. We got in a huge fight because I was working for Progenix. Remember? Uh, yeah, I do remember that. It, so we'd been dating. Oh, I was going to say, boys don't remember shit like that. <laughs> the way that you worded that. I was working for Progenix. So I was there as his girlfriend. I wasn't competing, but this, I wasn't pregnant. We had been dating for like less than a year. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time we had been to any sort of thing like this where he's competing, but I, I had work to do. Like I managed all of the Progenix athletes. And so I want, you know, he, he was used to the girlfriend just kind of being there for kind of what it, his beck and call at the, at the seminar or at the competitions. And I was like, I can't just like be sitting here in the warm up area with you. Like I got shit I gotta go do. Like I'm, I'm working right now. And it was, we got in a pretty big argument about it. Yeah, I was being, you know, I think it goes <laughs> down to most men, right? When you take the time to 
realize that uh, those things and you become insecure, men become very baby and very like sensitive, way more sensitive than they like to admit. Um, uh, but yeah, that's what I said. All those things have just helped me get to where I'm at now, which is, I, and, and then you get to a point where you feel proud of yourself because you did it on your own. You know, you used, you took something and you, you didn't let it crumble you and give you more uh, insecurities. You rose up top of that. And now it's great because then I would communicate with her what I was learning. And then when it came to nutrition stuff, given that she had so much knowledge with that, then I would just open up and we'd have really good conversations, you know, and then I just kept going and then I ran with it. And then it just taught me, well, everything's so easy to learn. You just have to literally just do it. I mean, it's so crazy, right? People just want this magic pill, but you just, you just got to do it, you know, and be okay with feeling embarrassed and, you know, at the beginning, but once more, every book you read, everything, you know, you, um, you work on all these uncomfortable conversations, just continue you take what you learned and you use it for your next experience and encounter. And it's just a, it's a snowball effect for sure. Julian is Miranda a better business partner or a better mate, a better wife? <laughs> wife or business partner? Um, or mom. I mean, I, I just think it all flows. I got to say, we're really lucky that everything just flows pretty smoothly with all of that, right? Um, but also it's what makes a relationship very difficult at times, you know, because we are working together and we have such important roles in this. Um, somehow we always go on a date night thinking that we're not gonna talk about work, <laughs> but then it ends up talking about work, you know. Um, I, I, she's just amazing. I think she's just a great a great partner to me in general. So I can't really say one or the other. It's, 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 it's equal on both sides. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Julian's answer, not mine. I'm just trying to make sure I understand <laughs> him correctly yeah. before I put it in stone. As I dug through your Instagram last night, I um, through the 3,700 posts that go back to 2012. You went all the way down. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Um, wow. And, and, and Julian, you're May of 2014 with um, only 700 posts. He deleted a lot of his posts. I did a lot oh. of that. so that way I didn't give them the credibility of being in my past, the people. <laughs> um, and, and I stumbled across this quote that talks about, where was it? I just saw it written down here, um, about not setting goals. And I've kind of touched on this with like, I touched on this with in the Jason podcast and um, I've touched on it with a lot of people who like talk about goals or visionaries or all this. And I would always just laugh because like, I feel just like Forrest Gump. I feel like I just, I have crazy discipline and crazy structure. And like, I'm, I can really, I have just a ton of self-control. Um, but I don't really know what to do with it. So I just have, and then you labeled it. I have beliefs that are very flexible, but, but I have strong beliefs. I have habits and, and yeah, I'm like, and I don't know where the passion comes from, but I'm crazy passionate. So how did you where did that? And then I was like, holy shit, Miranda, now I don't need goals anymore. I can quit being fucking insecure every time I talk to someone with goals. Because I'm like, what's wrong with me? How come I don't have goals? I talked to this guy the other day, this amazing guy. And he's like, yeah, I want to show dad. He's like, I see what you're doing with your Instagram. You want to show all dads on your Instagram how to be better dads. I'm like, oh, no, I think that's a goal. I don't think I have that. <laughs> like, I don't have anything that grandiose outside of myself, I guess. I, But um, I where did you find that? Were, do, were you ever in that position with me too? Were you ever like, fuck, how come I don't have any goals? Or like, tell me how you came to that. Yeah, I mean. I, and thank you. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what prompted that post because there's usually something mm -hmm. that prompts these things, whether it's some random DM that I got or conversation that I had with someone. And I don't remember exactly but it could have been five years ago. I mean, I, w I don't remember I where, but it's it a long like time a ago. year or two ago. I don't think it was okay. that long, but, um, you know, we see, we, we have this Facebook group with our street parking members and we see there's 30,000 people in this group and we see these people that are Boss, like, so crazy, <laughs> so crazy. Okay. And in the fitness space, whether you have 
10 personal training clients or a gym with 200 members or, you know, free parking community, people come in with these goals, these very measurable goals. And, it, and it's part of where we come from too, with CrossFit and there's people, we like to measure stuff and everything. And that's great. Um, but what we've been trying to instill in people, and I think, you know, if I really look back through my Instagram, I think the common thread all the way back from when I hurt my neck, even eight years ago, um, is that it, I've been trying to show a way of life and a way of thinking and just habits and like, let that carry you through when it comes to fitness specifically and what it's done for me. Um, and, and yeah, I guess that's just, I never had the goal of a certain fran time or a certain this or that, or a certain, that, that stuff just never appealed to me. I just enjoyed the process. It's always enjoying the process. Now, of course, when I was on the team, we had the goal of winning as a group. Um, and you have that stuff in mind, but once that was gone, even nothing changed. Like my habits were still there. My passion for doing what I was doing was still there. I was never doing what I was doing just for that goal. I was doing it because I loved it the whole time. And until people find that their goals are going to be meaningless once they reach them, or they're not going to have learned anything from it. And they'll just the habits that they form to reach the goal. So what we're trying to instill in our members, and I think what I've been trying to say for 10 years now is to find a love for this lifestyle and not stop chasing the 10 pound weight loss or the 5k time or the, you know, whatever, and, and find something that you can just love and build the habits based around that. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. A, a habit is something that you do regularly and that you're committed to and is, is that what a habit is i mean what what and the reason why i'm asking the definition is because i'm going to grab julian here and ask him what one of his good habits is i mean I what's think a, a good habit, habit a habit is something that you just do without even thinking about it right there can be good habits or bad habits but it's just kind of a part of your, whether it's a part of your day or your week or whatever it's not something that you decide to do anymore it's it just happens it's not a decision. Julian, Julian, what's a good habit you have that you think that like something every day you do? Every day I try to learn something new. Every day I think I've, you know, now to a point where I've accepted that you just don't stop growing as an individual, right? And I think that's one of these things that listening to audiobooks or reading books in general has shown me every book embarks you on this new journey and you're just like, wow, just when I thought I knew stuff, I don't. And then you realize that each world has its own world. Each section has its own world of things that you can choose to learn. And I, that to me drives me to just wake up knowing that I'm going to learn something new and just keep that, keep that path going. Right. And not, it can get overwhelming at times for sure. Cause then you start like, Oh my gosh, like I, you start questioning yourself. Like, I don't know anything. And now I just got to go <laughs> now. Oh my gosh. I, now I want to be a real estate agent. Oh my gosh. Now I want to be a stock trader. No, now I want to do this, you know, or, or I, but just taking a step back and realizing, you know, and just enjoying the process. And, and, uh, but yeah, that's like a daily habit of mine. So just how about to, you? Mm -hmm. How about you, Miranda? What's a, what's a daily habit you have? That's a good habit. You know, uh, this is somewhat of a new habit, but it has become a habit. I, it's, I guess, a year and a half or so old now. I was given uh, for my birthday a year and a half ago, um, this little box with these little postcards in there. They're like small. And the this is from one of our employees. She said just every day, she's like, I know you don't have time to like keep a journal and you're not going to do something like that. She's like, but every day, just write your favorite memory of the day on this little postcard, date it, and then put it in the back. And I do it religiously every single night. And I, so I have a year and a half of just these little moments that are so small that I would probably forget them. But now I can go and just pull one out randomly and laugh or smile or whatever. And uh, I think it's just that small, you know, people are always talking about gratitude and how important it is and just, you know, recapping the day. And I think journaling and that kind of stuff's important, but I, she's right. I'm not gonna take time to write some big long thing. This small habit, though, is something that I've really enjoyed and I think is going to bring a lot of joy later in my life also. 
That's cool. That takes uh, that writing thing takes discipline, even that yeah. little tiny bit. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, completely change the subject. After I scroll through this massive Instagram account and I see a ton of familiar faces and I see a ton of people that I really like, but I didn't see Josh Bridges once. <laughs> How can there be no Josh Bridges? One of my favorite people. Has he ever <laughs> graced your Instagram account? I know this is going from something substantial to so superficial, but I just love Josh. And I'm just like, where's my Josh? Where's my Josh in Miranda moment? I have Josh memories, like definitely some shit talking back and forth with Josh. But I don't know. I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time with him in person. So he doesn't get to grace your Instagram. I mean, I guess not. How it, is your speaking? Speaking. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, maybe it was that was the joke. It, it might have been the joke at some point. I don't know. But yeah, I, I've definitely had spent time with him, but not a lot. Um, how's your coffee? How's how's the street parking coffee? Because I'm a good dudes guy. Do we even still have it? Still yeah, we, have yeah it? they made us like a, yeah. We have some we can send you over for sure. I, I, we love it. I oh, mean, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't doing that. I just as I was digging through your account, I saw that there's street parking coffee. I'm just wondering how good is it? Yeah, it's I'm not begging. Right I'm not begging. Oh, so we went to go do a tasting. So we went and met with the barista, and he like brought out different beans, mixed certain things. It was a cool experience for sure. Uh, we love it. I mean, it, it, because we, we're Phil's fans. And Miranda introduced yeah. me to Phil's. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is so tasty. You know. Um, yeah, I do um, know. Have you, I, I can't stand Phil's. Um, I like the coffee. I can't stand the experience. The yeah, yeah, the experience. It's just like, ugh. Is it too long? Does it take too long for you? Just, you it just, it's just too, yeah. It's like, I my it's like they want you to have a moment of zen in there and slow down and like go through no no thank you i like to get my coffee and go outside and watch my kids jump i remember (laughs) i would come to work at crossfit headquarters and i would want some coffee literally the conversation from like dave lees or whoever would be like cool it'll be ready in 20 minutes and i'd be like what's going on with this coffee like just give me a cup of coffee it was like that's why that off that's why that office failed (laughs) <laughs> yeah no it's good we made it a good coffee um we are at an hour and 12 minutes um i would love to um god i didn't even turn the page yet we can talk i mean we have another 15 minutes of uh okay let me ask you this one this one's good um have you received any uh, let me even be more obtuse than that um would you take outside investors? No. Have you guys no. talked about that? We've talked about it in the set as this is the entire conversation. Hey guys, you got to keep in mind that this is all our money and we're never going to get money from someone else. So let's keep it simple. That's as far as the conversation has ever gone. <laughs> yeah. One of the things we're definitely very prideful of is that we started this business by exchanging my meal prep food at the time with Chris G who now works for us full time. He used to work at Progenics. He designed our logo for an exchange of food. We had chance in design our website for exchange of food. Um, <laughs> and then it just kind of blew up in that. So we have no debt, you know, and we're very prideful of that. We feel like we kind of were okay with um, letting this process unfold and we're enjoying the journey. We're enjoying the growth of it. Um, we're not trying to, you know, you can see it, right? With some some people like, oh, you can see this 100,000 members. It's like, slow down because what you're not processing from 30,000 members to 100,000 members is what the community is going to feel like and what we're trying to accomplish with this, right? And what kind of obstacles come in our way. That's exciting on a numbers on money wise, but what is our purpose? for having a hundred thousand members, you know, as we're trying to grow this thing. So, you know, we, we feel good about where we're at. You know, I had a, um, I know you interviewed Jason. Actually, I called him like 20 minutes before this. And I was like, Jason, tell me, is Savon going to be asking me weird stuff? Like, just give me the load on. He's like, no, it's super cool. But I, um, did he really say that? <laughs> yeah. He did he really say great experience, but I did ask him, I was like, what, what am I getting myself into here? Anyway. Uh, I had the experience of being around the seminar staff, which was just 
this amazing learning experience of how to be the most incredible coach and and speak and give this information in a way that's digestible for people and all of it. And then I was also around Silicon Valley and Jason Kalipa and his, I mean, say what you want about Jason, but his energy and how he's infectious and always has all these ideas, too, way too many ideas most of the time. Um, I was around that at the same time. And where I, where we differ from that culture is, and we're happy with our home. We're happy with the cars that we drive. We're happy with our lifestyle. And so we never want to get to a place where we're chasing money um, and where we have to have a certain number of members because we took on these investors and they expect it from us. So, so you guys are living within your means. Yeah. yeah one of the, one of the yeah. big obstacles we face now that's very difficult, and we have this conversation so many times as we're trying to put our boys to bed and we have moments alone, we're in this phase of there's already not enough time throughout the day and our boys are three and six months old and we just want to capture all these moments with them because we see how fast time moves, right? And we look through our phones and we see when Knox was at Banner's age and you're just like, oh my gosh. So we love the fact that we're in an opportunity to be able to spend lots of quality time with our boys um, because it, it's only a matter of time before they become independent. They want to hang out with their friends they don't think we're cool where right now it's all about the snuggles, you know, the taking baths together, you know, it's such a special thing. So let's just say you bring investors. Then there's, there's the pressure of making sure the business is performing. Like we had to talk with our accountant. And I said, Hey, look, man, don't do projections and, or don't share them with us because that will put a pressure. If we're not hitting our projections now that we have, we have a full-time accountant that shit, like, are we not doing what we're supposed to be doing? You know, and then we feel like we need to dive into the business, which then takes away time from spending with our boys. And then there's our time together. We love, like, it's okay to slow down right now um, and not have this weight over our shoulders thinking that we need to perform a certain way, you know, so. And, you know, like, we, we have the conversation all the time, and I tell him all the time that, no amount of like success or money or members or accolades or whatever, it's all meaningless um, if this falls apart, like if our relationship and our family falls apart. And I think that's one thing, you know, um, that I learned from having a nine year relationship or a 10 year relationship before this was it's like both of us were very successful and doing stuff that we loved, but like that period was so hard with that uh, relationship ending. And it's like, again, bringing that in and not allowing that to ever happen again. And seeing how important it is that this relationship is so much more important. And, and if the business starts to take away from that and our family, I know from experience that it's not worth it, you know, so. There's like even videos that have like reaffirmed that for me recently, like, there was like a video of Kevin O'Leary, the Shark Tank, you know, investor, and he was being interviewed by this uh, young kid, and oh, actually, like around my age, actually, I I think that because they these sometimes the kids that look my age just look so small and scrawny and like <laughs> <laughs> so weird, right? racist, racist. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, if that's ever, not I, even the right I, word, but I don't know. I'm just yeah. Just, in 2020, everything is. Um, and they asked him like, "What do you regret?" Or do you have a close relationship with your your sons? And he's like, I don't as much as I would like to, because when I was trying to build where I'm at now, it required a lot of hours, a lot of time away. And you know it, right? Like depending on what business you're in or, you know, what kind of company you're involved in, it's like the long hours, the, the grind, the hustle. Well, we know this. And I feel like the busier we get or the bigger we get, the less I want to do because... I don't want to get in that position where then it takes away because then it feels like time's running away from our boys and his family. And that is sad. That's the one thing that you see a lot of people that are successful will have the same answer. Like I wish I had more time with my family and those moments of the boys growing up or their kids growing up. 
it's just not what I, not, not what I, it's not worth it to me. It's really cool though, because I think that that is, it aligns so much with our message, with our members. Um, we created what we created so that people can have more time with their families. So it would actually, we would be hypocritical to create a program to help other people spend more time with their families and then be working on it so hard that we're not spending time with ours. How does your program allow more time for the families? Then they don't have to drive to the gym. They can stay at home and cut off and save an hour every day of parking, exactly. getting out of the car. Yeah, all of that. And I mean, uh, stopping the at the donut shop on the way home from the gym. Yeah, all of it. Just keep just simplifying fitness for them and simplifying what they feel like they need to be doing. And they don't need part A, B, and C. They can just do the 12 minutes with the dumbbells and then move on with their day. And their kids can be in the garage when they're doing it and, and, and watch them and be a part of it. And so, and our members have been very um, supportive of that. When I had banner mm -hmm. six months ago, if they saw me commenting on Facebook, like with the weeks afterwards, they were like, what are you doing? Like, well, we're fine. Don't check in on us. Go do be postpartum, like go be with your baby. Like everything's good. Um, and that's a culture. They that didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I, I mean, in a way we're responsible for setting the example in that way. And it's great. I'm tripping. I'm, I'm tripping. I started tripping. Um, Julian's 31. I'm 48. <laughs> we basically have the same kids. I have a six-year-old and two, three-year-olds. Wow. You have, you have a three-year-old and a six-month-old. Yeah. I spend every minute of my kids waking hours, um, with them. Like I am with my kids, like nonstop. When I was 31, I think I was living at home, growing, growing dope in my mom's closet, <laughs> trying, uh, trying to find uh, produce some show for ESPN, making a commercial for someone else here. Like I was just, just, just hustling, just grinding. And my thirties were crazy grinding years, man. Just head down. I mean, I was, I'm, I still, <clears throat> I still am a workaholic. Now you're 31 and you can do stuff with your kids. Like I can't really do stuff with my kids. I mean, I can, but like, I can't do six hours of Frisbee. I can do 20 minutes. I don't do jujitsu with them. So all these things that your dad did with you, I have to hire people. So I hire a ballet teacher. He has a jujitsu coach. He has a striking coach. He has a tennis coach. He has a skateboarding coach. And I just go to all these things, right? With my Yeti cup full of coffee. And I'm like, yeah, that's my boy kicking ass, you know, <laughs> but, but like, I, I, I can't get in the mix, but it's a, it's a trip. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I, like on one hand, I want to be like, Hey man, stop everything and just do your kids full time. It's crazy. It's just like the best thing I've ever done in my life. But then on the other hand, my thirties were just, I was a fucking donkey that could carry the world on its back up a hill. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're in your grinding years. You have your 30 years of experience. And so man, you're in it. You have, you have too many gifts right now. <laughs> yeah, so don't, I mean, one of the sorry, Miranda. That, sorry, Miranda. I, you're, you're 38. You're not. You still have a couple more years of grinding, and you're still in your 30s. But 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 Julian's at the beginning of the. I mean, he's a super donkey right now, and like, yeah. and like, what's he gonna put on his back? Is he gonna put this business on his back, or is he gonna put um his kids on his back, or both? It's yeah. A, so one of the trip. obviously, in knowing. So when I say the busier street parking gets, or the bigger gets, the less I want to do with it, and just. But it's also making sure that what I do choose to do with it is very valuable. So mm -hmm. I'll go live and make sure I make sure I talk to our members. I'll make sure I stop in and have the conversations with the team that I need to have, make sure I'm present with the community. At the same time, when I'm spending time with the boys or something, or I'm here at home, I'm, as I'm listening, that's what when I noticed I brought, earlier, I brought up these like real estate books and stuff like that and stocks, because now you know, we, you know, building up, we've started building up a real estate portfolio. And now anytime we've, you know, we have properties under our belt, uh, you know, I have a team of people that now I call, we have everything dialed in. So, you know, if we want to close on a house, we're closed within 30 days, you know, um, and it's shown that. And so it's, it's, it's so crazy, right? Because now I know that busy doesn't always mean physically busy. I try to keep myself busy by educating myself. So when an opportunity arises, I know to the best of my ability that I'll do it to the best that I can and execute and get creative with it because I've gotten creative. I mean, it's all, it's all the same, right? I mean, if I was able to sell cupcakes and get creative and just walk in, 
all this to me, to be honest, is super easy because it's a business of dealing with people. So that has come second nature. It's like, okay, you know, you just, just have a connection with somebody, talk to somebody, you know, and it's been great. So we've all, we've been able to, you know, already start planning for, you know, the years where we're able to even relax even more because we're investing in things outside of our business and letting it grow. Right. Um, so all this, these are our retirement accounts, speaking conversation with our financial advisors, making sure adult I- stuff, adult stuff, yeah, adult stuff. And then that stuff that to me, you know, Miranda has admitted, she's like, I hate that stuff. Don't talk. I, I, so to me, I'm like, all right, I actually have been really enjoying this stuff because it's stuff that I felt like I neglected for so long. Cause I just felt like I didn't, I couldn't play this game because I was just trying to get by and focus on doing, I don't even know what I was doing at this point, I'm training, working out. <laughs> um, but now it's time for me to catch up on those things, right? Um, investments, portfolio, all those things. When so you guys buy a house, you fill out all the paperwork, Julian? So yeah, we're both on it. Yeah, but yeah, we, I just, hey, you have stuff to sign, you know? So she just goes and signs what she has to sign. Yeah. My wife does all that stuff, bank loans, houses. Like the only, I, I like doing the online banking. She puts the bills on my desk because then I, that's just, you just go to the computer and I like dumping in the, pushing the numbers and send. But any stuff that like requires, like you got to read through the paper. Uh, nah, nah, sign, sign my signature. You know, to his credit too, though, because you're right. Um, and when you're looking at traditional culture of maybe dad roles versus mom roles and and male and female and his age versus my age. Um, He does a lot more with the kids. I mean, it sounds like you're in a similar situation. He does a lot more with the kids than I would say most dads do. And we could make a decision where it's like, okay, Julian, you go be like super street parking, hardcore. You're in the office all day, every day. And I'm going to be, take a step back, which I have in a way, but not really. It would be such a waste of the experience that I have as a coach to do that, right? So what we talk about all the time is there are very few people on earth who have the experience as like a coach and a programmer and all of that stuff that I have. And so oh, we, we need it. You're being you're being humble saying that, by the way. It is crazy the experience <laughs> you have. It's, it's a, you have a, there's probably a hundred of you on the planet. There's probably only a hundred of you on the planet. And now you're sort of even gone next level with it. And maybe you're in a category all to yourself. Maybe you'll be the next CEO of CrossFit. <laughs> uh, just Dave's boss. Um, Hell yeah. We just hire him. So that would actually be detrimental to all of it. It would be detrimental to the business. It would be detrimental to our, our, the future for our family. It would be detrimental to our boys seeing that we took on those traditional roles in our, in my opinion, in our opinion. So um you know he could grind and and work more but it wouldn't necessarily be for a better or more uh, better outcome it's very we're very balanced in that way and we we have equal partnership in the business and in the raising of the kids and and all of it so um i would say that it's like a huge shout out to his ability as a 31 year old very alpha person to to go that route and be is he is he alpha is he alpha is Julian alpha I think so I would say like you like alpha because I'm getting kind of some girl power shit from you this is a whole I I have to end this conversation here too my I gotta take my kid to tennis clinic but man you want to tell me Julian's alpha I want to that's a great is he like and how do you handle that because don't you have some women power like something to prove thing going I I do and in the business I feel that we're very equal and in the raising of our kids, we're very equal, but in our relationship, he is the, the man in our relationship. And he, you know, I'm the crier and he's the toughen up and you're going to be okay. And let me, you know, catch the baby in the bathtub at our home birth, you know, so. Racist, racist. <laughs> and, I need a button that just says that. But that is what I prefer. Yeah. 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 And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. You guys are the best. Thank you. you. What are you going to, what are you going to, what are you going to say when the next pod person calls you is going to be on my podcast and be like, okay, what do I have anything to worry about? 
I literally thought you were going to be like, so tell me about the night that Knox was conceived. Like that's. <laughs> I mean, I could have, I got those questions on here. I got three pages of questions. You guys just say interesting shit. So I couldn't do it. I want I mean, I'd like to do that. I saw that there was home birth talk on your thing versus hospital. I mean, I love all that stuff. I mean, I could have come on here and been like, are you voting for Trump or Biden? And really just fuck shit up. Yeah. So it was good. Okay. Thank you. Julian. I apologize for my ways. Forgive me. No, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't look back in the past like that. I'm good. Okay. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank, man. Thank you. You got Bye. it. Man. Bye.